This week on CrossFeed. Does your address change your religion? The nature of God. What mascot would a gay high school have? Is God sexist or isn't he? Or isn't she? No church music in China. Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I am Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Better known as the man in black tonight, I am Dr. Jim Butler, service pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, the man in the good color of white tonight. So, yeah, like com- the, complete uh, with a, I don't know if you can see this, oh, there it is, Lutheran Social Services of New England logo, so... It's when I volunteered, volunteered for LSS a couple times. Well, I'm wearing my tube mogul shirt. It's uh, um, it's the service that we use to upload this to all those different uh, uh, sites like YouTube and Rever and all that kind of stuff, which some of you are probably watching this on. So it uploads it all at once for us. I filled out a survey. They sent me a free T-shirt. Like, cool. Cool. <laughs> Great. Absolutely. Um. I had, actually, it hasn't been that many days since we saw each other. It's just been since uh, Sunday night, but uh, I hope you've had a good week. We've had just a gorgeous week up here in New England. The, the leaves are changing. Uh, we've got spectacular color this year. Uh, it's probably one of the best years that I remember. And driving around up here, and it, it's right now, it's just at its peak for leaf peeping in Massachusetts. So I've just really enjoyed driving around and uh, making my calls and seeing all the change of colors and uh yeah. Most of the leaves are down from our trees by now. Uh, I got wow. in the car this morning to take my daughter to school, and um, I hit the wipers to, to clear all the dew off the car, and it went, oh, frost. <laughs> well, we have a garage, but because of the flooding that we had the spring, um, a lot of the kids' toys and stuff are out in the garage, and we haven't rearranged stuff uh, so that we can get the car in yet, so we've been parking it in the driveway. And uh, so, yeah, I, I go, where's the scraper? <laughs> and uh, thankfully, I found it pretty easily. That time of year. Uh, well, we had, uh, my son was driving uh, his car today, uh, his and my, my daughter's. I bought them a car to use. They, they have a Ford Focus. And uh, my older son was in a wreck with it a couple of years ago, and apparently uh, he did a, a – somebody cut him off on the highway, and he wound up losing control and wound up running it to the side and up a um, a curb, and they repaired it. Well, apparently they didn't repair something because today the uh, control arm broke. It just snapped in two places. Ooh. And – uh so fortunately, he was just driving locally. The guy told him, he said, you know, if you'd been um, out on the highway somewhere doing this, um, you'd be dead right now. But there's no way in the world you could have kept control and the car would have flipped. Wow. But fortunately, he was only going about 30 miles an hour on a local road. and So, um, but my guy's going to supposed to call us tomorrow about what it's going to cost to repair it. I'm going to call our insurance company and see if we can arrange something since it's from that, that thing. But uh, so, but that's 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 life here. Now Dale lives out there in um, the um, rural area of Iowa, and I live out here in suburban Massachusetts, suburban Boston. And of course, we have some people, you know, who live in the urban areas. Does that change the way they view things politically? Even people who are theologically kind of the same. Um, I'm going to reset the background here. And um, it was an interesting article that we came across on, uh, this is from Christianity Today on one of their blogs uh, called uh, Out of Ur. And uh, this uh, guy is now a, um, he was in a suburban church in 2004. He's in an urban church now in urban uh, Chicago, apparently. And He said, it's interesting here, um, he says, people who theologically are in the same place, 
voting for, you know, last time voting for Bush over Kerry, but this time bearing, uh, very much, uh, supportive of, of Obama, even wearing, uh, one of his worship leaders wore an Obama t-shirt to church. <laughs> but she covered up with a jacket. Yeah. yeah. See, you know, that's, that's an interesting thing all by itself. You know, is it appropriate to wear, um, a, a political thing, whether it be a shirt or a button on your jacket or whatever to church? Are you a God fearing man, Senator? I'd say, yeah, it, it'd be all right. I mean, because you're exercising your, uh, your vocation as a citizen. Oh, I would never think so, but simply because, um, to do so, I think would, you know, so you're wearing an Obama t-shirt up there, um, and you've got people of the congregation who, you know, may, you know, have very strong, you know, reaction to that. Well, I'm thinking about, I'm, I'm not talking about the pastor, I'm talking about, like, individual members. Now, a worship leader, individual. if, you know, if you're talking like a, a liturgist or, or somebody who's kind of up in front, you know, then, yeah, that would, that would be a problem. But I'm talking about the person in the pew. Well, even the other day um, at our, our pastor's conference, um, one of the guys came in wearing a McCain Palin button. And I knew, I know the guy sitting next to him. And, you know, I was sitting there going, you know, I knew the, the other guy was probably seething. Because that's, you know, he's he's... I know who he's voting for. I know his position and, and why. Uh, because, uh, but, you know, so it's, you know, and I, I talk to different pastors who, you know, are of the Democrat persuasion, some of our own LCMS pastors, icky. Uh, and, uh, you know, but, you know, but, and, and they, you know, it, it kind of gets in the way of ministry sometimes. So I, I wouldn't think it's a good idea. I just, just, but here we have two churches, though. Okay, um, you know he says they're 25 miles apart. These two churches that he served, but he said it in their their political views, almost miles apart. Yeah, but he said that um, you know, salvation by grace through faith and regular gospel proclamation are theological priorities for both churches. Corporate worship in both is a contemporary mix of new praise songs and old hymns. Both care admirably for the practical needs of the homeless men and women in their neighborhoods. So, you know, theologically, they're right in line with each other. They even had the same pastor at different times. <laughs> right. So, but, yeah, um, politically. You know, and that, that's one reason that I don't like using the word conservative when we're talking about religion. That, you know, because as soon as you say liberal or conservative, people automatically think politics. And, Politically. Yeah, and, and very often, um, you know, that is the case, right? Um, that if you're theologically liberal, you tend to be, uh, you know, politically liberal. But not always, and, and not even necessarily the majority of the time. I know lots of guys who are very conservative theologically, but um, but are planning on voting for Obama. Um, there was um, back in the 1980s. There was a guy I can't remember his name now, but he was the only ordained LCMS pastor to ever be elected to Congress. I think his name was Mueller, if I'm not mistaken. He was from Ohio. But he's the only guy, only ordained LCMS pastor ever to be elected. Uh, he was elected as a Democrat. Hmm. And he spoke to us at uh, Concordia College when I was in Ann, Ann Arbor. He came up and spoke. Now, right behind me was a guy who was about as Republican as they came in life. Very, very conservative. And so he was there. I mean, I would, this guy was just fascinating to listen to. But he stood up there and he told us, he said, I want you to know that my opinion conservative confessional theology and liberal politics go hand in hand. <laughs> I thought this guy behind me was going to throw up. I thought he was going to die as I was sitting there. I was listening to another podcast, and I'll recommend this one too. Uh, it's done by an LCMS pastor. His name is Dion Garrett, and the name of the podcast is called The Six. And uh, the name comes from that uh, on one day a week we go to 
uh, to worship. But this podcast is all about living out the, uh, the six in between. And, um, and he does it specifically for his congregation in Detroit. Um, but it's, a uh, uh, I listen to it because it's got a great, uh, devotional, uh, great missions, uh, message and stuff like that. And I really enjoy it. Um, but, uh, he was talking about, uh, missional politics and, uh, and he was, he was saying, you know, some people believe that, um, you know, that the, the Republican doctrine of, uh, trickle down economics, uh, is in the Bible somewhere, you know? And, and he said, and, you know, and other people, you know, believe that there's... It uh, isn't? <laughs> you know, and he, he said, you know, there's other people that believe that, you know, different uh, democratic, you know, pr- principles that, um, are are there, you know, and, and, and it's just like, he, he said, you know, there are certain aspects of, of both parties that, you know, that both parties emphasize... You know, um, uh, Republicans tend to emphasize uh, uh, the pro-life position, um, which is very biblical. And um, but uh, Democrats uh, tend to emphasize uh, uh, environmental issues um, more so than Republicans, and which is very biblical. Uh, Democrats tend to uh, also tend to emphasize uh, taking care of the poor. Um, more so than Republicans, and um, which is also a very biblical issue. And you know, at, at the same time, both will say, "Well, no, we, you know, we're concerned with all that." And um, you know, Republicans will say, "No, we we're concerned about the poor too. We just have a different way of of uh, approaching it." And um, and uh, and we're, you know, I know lots of uh, lots of hunters uh, who are uh, because of the. Republican position on uh, guns, it, you know, but they, as hunters, they enjoy nature and they want to preserve it, you know, um, <laughs> so they can kill it. But, <laughs> but no, I mean, you know, a lot of hunters, they uh, enjoy just being out in the woods and or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. more so than the actual killing an animal. So, um you know, so both of them, it's, and, and here's the thing, really politics comes down to, um, for the most part, politicians ideally, um, have the same goals. You know, they want to help as many people as possible. And, um, and, and it's all comes down to what's your, what's your theory on what's the best way to do that, to accomplish that goal. You know, I mean, if you, you look at, uh, you ask, well, um, you know, do ask if you went into the debate and say, do we need to support our schools? Well, yeah. <laughs> do we need to help the poor? Well, of course. You know, <laughs> you know, do do we need to to come up with a way that that all people can have uh, good health care one way or another? Well, yeah. You know, <laughs> there's you know, there's no debate. All the debate is on how to do that. And you know what? The Bible doesn't really answer that question. Now, I mean, there's some differences, like for instance, the abortion um, question. You know, whereas some say, but you know, even there, there's arguably, um, you know, both are are against abortions happening, but um, it's it's a matter of um, how to prevent them from happening. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a, uh, well, there are groups like Democrats for Life. Mm-hmm. Uh, which personally, I mean, this makes sense. I've always thought a pro-life position is much more in line with the democratic philosophy of taking care of those who can't speak for themselves. Mm-hmm. I always thought that was a very classically liberal position, um, as opposed to a um, um, you know conservative um, keep government out of people's lives. But there they flipped. But uh, now I I, um, I was telling the guys that at our pastors conference the other day that uh, I've given some thought to actually to because um, you know this is such a democratic state I mean we have you know in like twenty Republicans in the House and the Senate or something like that together I mean it's really kind of sad I thought about running as a conservative independent uh, for a House seat in in our state rep, state rep because it's a part time position. And my slogan would, they, they said, really? I said, yeah, my slogan would be, the money's got to come from somewhere. 
<laughs> and some of the other guys they tell standing up at a debate telling me all his great plans and look all the money's gotta come from somewhere. So who's gonna pay it? Now here it is, folks. This is what he wants. You know, you're willing to pay for it. Fine. You know, I, I think I can, you know, go, go take that to a, 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 a you know, to, to, to United States Congress, and you know, be my argument. Money's got to come from somewhere, folks. Yep. And uh, I, I mean, I would love to have a debate on health care with John Kerry, and I would look to him and say, "How much money are you worth?" You know, twenty million, right? I, I think I read the other day. Is that much money? How many people can you pay for health care with that? <laughs> what? Eight million is not enough for you to live on? You, know, you couldn't get 12 million people and pay a whole lot of people, 12 million dollars and give a whole bunch of people health care? And you call yourself a Democrat? <laughs> you care about these people? And what about Teddy? How much is he worth? You know? See, this, this got me last year when, you know, Michael Moore's movie Sicko came out and he took these guys around and took them to Cuba to get health care. Like, you're worth millions. You couldn't pay it. If I had that kind of money and I had five guys who were sick, I'd take them to the hospital and say, you know, I'd take them to, um, you know, uh, Tufts University Hospital or one of the, you know, great teaching hospitals we have up here, Brigham and Women's or something like that. And I'd say, fix them. I got millions. Yeah. Just bill me. Yeah, yeah. So, exactly. But the money's got to come from somewhere. That's what I, that, that would be my thing. The money's got to, that'd be my slogan. The money's got to come from somewhere. So, um, maybe that's the thing. I really kind of moved. I, I actually was, was at one time fairly liberal government oriented in my politics, but somewhere along the line, I just got this idea that, well, what came clear to me is that, um, government always has strings attached and there's no magic pile of money out there and you know no matter what we do we've got to make choices and uh, uh, I'm not saying healthcare in America is great now but um, you got to make choices yeah. and you know yeah. it's it's if we go to a universal healthcare system where the government pays it there's going to be some people who aren't going to get taken care of they're going to come up to somebody who's older who's 90 years old and say Sorry, buddy. You know, you, you, you know, you can't have a heart transplant at 90 years old. This doesn't make any sense. Go home and die. Um, and the other hand, I mean, you got somebody who's been through rehab twice and is still a drug abuser. At what point do you sit there and say, "Look, you're making your choice. You won't get well. You're continuing to abuse your body. We can't do anything for you. Sorry. Money's got to come from somewhere. That's my slogan." Now, at the end of the article, there's some I interesting, don't care where you live in the country. Um, interesting questions. And, and I think these are really uh, very practical questions for a church as you discuss mm-hmm. politics. All right. Here's the questions. And, and this is something for all of you to ask of your church, uh, whether you're a pastor or whether you're a, a lay person or, or whatever your position is in the church. Would a person of any political persuasion feel welcome in our church? Does our teaching and community life reflect both the local values of our neighborhood and the global ethics of the church? You know, because different places you go, you're going to have different values. I'm sure that... Um, now, that, what if you happen to live in Provincetown or Key West, these major gay areas? Um, would your te- should your teaching in that case reflect the local values? Well, that's, you know, that's a good point. But at the same time, your local values are going to, um, or you're, you, you are going to need to emphasize, um, uh, mutual respect. That's right. And still, and, still would be an issue with that question. Well, yeah, this is true. Yeah. I mean, you know, if the local value is contrary to the Bible, obviously you can't go that direction. Um, but you know, there's still stuff that you're going to pick up from your community. All right. Go ahead and go for your third one. Um, is our church regularly reminded that our hope is in Christ and that our solidarity is with the diverse people of God's kingdom? And I think that's really important, and that's what really bothers me about uh, churches where the pastor stands up and tells people how to vote. And there have been a lot of uh, stories going through the news about those. I haven't posted them all but because uh, they're getting kind of redundant. But, um, you know, there's pastors that are saying, well, I'm going to challenge the IRS and, and I'm going to... Um, you know, I'm not, I'm going to promote a particular candidate. 
And um, sorry, buddy, you're supposed to be promoting Christ, not McCain or Obama. Right. There, there's, 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 I have actually two other guiding principles, too, by the way. Number one, we're in a fallen world, so there's no perfect answers. I don't care who's elected. I don't care what they're promising. Right now, they're promising fairy stories, as far as I'm concerned. Hmm. Either one of them is talking about the fact that we owe $10 trillion to people around the world, and that's going to put a real crimp in anything they want to do. Uh, you know, and nobody's talking about, you know, all those baby boom moves are going to retire and what they're going to do with Social Security in a few more years. Yeah, they really uh, haven't touched that one, have they? they? No, uh-uh. And, and, and that, I mean, and these are some real questions that need to be dealt with. Uh, but no matter what answer, that there's always the law of unintended consequences. No matter what law you pass, something else is going to come to cause another problem. Yep. I mean, it's just the nature of being in a fallen world. There's no perfect answers, no matter where you are. Uh, uh, second, uh, my other principle I always go by is this world's not the end of things. And our job is to point our hope in Christ to the day of the new heaven and the new earth. And not look for our, our salvation in anything here, but our salvation in the cross and the empty tomb in the new world coming with our Lord. And that's where our focus always needs to be. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, gosh. So, how sexist is your church, Dale? <laughs> you know, it, it's it's funny that we hit this story because um, I was just having a discussion this morning. I suppose I had already picked out the story for tonight, but uh, I was in Bible class this morning, and we, we've been studying the Book of Luke, and um, and we're we're right at the the crucifixion right now. And when Jesus was crucified, the women stuck around. They were right there at the foot of the cross. The men, they scattered. You know, and then Jesus rises from the dead. Who does he appear to? The women. The men go down there. He's nowhere to be found. They were the ones that he said, go tell the men. And then, um, you know, and then we were talking about, um, you know, Christmas versus Easter. And you go back to Christmas, go back to the Annunciation. You know, who was the first Christian? Mary, a woman, she was the first one to know that the Messiah had come and to believe um, that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God. And um, and so, you know, even the first Christian was a woman. And um, so, you know, we were we were just talking about this this morning and, uh, you know, how um, how much the the Bible just sort of lifts up women and says, look at these, these great women, you know? So, uh, we've got this, <laughs> this, this kind of amuses me, honestly. Um, th- it's, uh, from the times online. Um, and it's, is the Bible sexist? New research claims the Bible's negative stance on women is a myth. This is new research. It's not true research. <laughs> Um, this, it's, you know, I mean, gosh, um, a lot of the stuff, I mean, you know, I read back in 85, um, you know, you could read groups like, uh, the, the, the council for evangelical feminine, no, what is it? What is the, the name of the, uh, I can't remember what the name of it is. Christians for biblical equality. That's it. And Phyllis Triple happened, who's quoted in there, happens to be part of that group, I believe. But this is, uh, but all this is old stuff. Matter of fact, we're, we're dealing in our church right now, a Bible study on women in the church. And, and, and so the first we started, and it's funny, a lot of the stuff that they talk about, we start talking about, um, you know, how positive women are mentioned in here. It's funny, they get mentioned because it starts, we, we talked about Miriam being a prophetess. Uh, Deborah, and being a leader and judge in Israel, um, uh, Hulda, the prophetess in um, uh, First in, in Second Kings. Um, we looked at um, who else did we? Uh, uh, we looked at uh, Hannah, the mother of uh, Samuel, and, and her prayer to God. Uh, we looked at uh, Anna and her prophecy about Jesus, although she just kind of mentioned real quickly there. Uh, but uh, Hannah, Anna, of course, really being Hannah in in, in the Greek uh, version of that. Uh, 
Mary, the, the Blessed Virgin, um, the mother of our Lord, um, looked at the women in, in Luke, where the men took off, and looked at the women going to the tomb, and the prophetesses of uh, Agabus, his daughters. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anybody who's been reading anything, I mean, you talk about Luke's gospel, Luke has a strong emphasis on women. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's just, you know, and, and Jesus himself, his ministry to women, it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, the, the story does mention um, specifically Luke, uh, which has sometimes been called the women's gospel because he puts such an emphasis on women. Um, Jesus uh, breaks convention um, by speaking to women and, and engaging them in conversation, which was seen as in that time as, as being uh, um, something you just don't do. Right. And he taught women. And remember the, um, the, the famous Pharisaical prayer, or the, the famous uh, rabbinical prayer. You know, God, I thank thee that I'm not a slave. God, I thank thee I'm not a Gentile. God, I thank thee that I'm not a woman. Hmm. Because slaves and Gentiles of women did not learn Torah. Women were specifically exempted from learning Torah. You know, did you ever see the movie uh, Gentil? No. No? It's about uh, Barbara Streisand. Yeah. Is a, and stuff, you know. You ever hear what Homer Simpson said about the movie? No. Yeah, that Yentil. No. She put the she in yeshiva. <laughs> I love that line. But anyway, um, but when Jesus is at the home of Mary and Martha, what we never get on is the fact that Mary is taking the position of a disciple, learning from a rabbi, which was almost unheard of. Matter of fact, the most important job women could do was take care of the house, take care of the men. Martha's doing what women were supposed to do. No wonder she's upset that Mary's not doing what women are supposed to do. Jesus flips that prayer upside down. I did not know that. Yeah, yeah, and he says, "Hey, get over here and listen." This is this is what you should be doing. Um, there's just so much uh, in, in the Bible that's just so positive uh, about women. Um, Although it was not un, it was not unheard of for women to learn Torah, uh, the Rabbi Gamaliel, Gamaliel, who was also Saint Paul, yeah, who was also Saint Paul's teacher, mm-hmm. he taught his daughter. He instructed his daughter in in Torah, in Talmud. See, he was kind of a liberal in his time. He was. He was very much so. <laughs> you wonder how in the world Paul could have been one of his students. Yeah. Yeah, he was as conservative as they come. But uh, and and also in First Timothy, um, where uh, we women are to learn quietness and submission, that was how the men were to learn. First off, Paul says women should learn rather than be exempted from learning, and second, they're to learn how the men learned. Now, I don't know about you, but I like people being quiet in my Bible class. You know, unless they raise their hand to ask a question, I don't want them out there gabbing. Well, if they're, uh, I, I tend to have a pretty conversational uh, class, but I, yeah, I don't want them uh, sitting and, and and chatting while I'm trying to teach. You know, if if I'm talking, you know, I, I want them to sit and pay attention, and, you know, and then you know respond, but respond to the discussion, not just kind of respond appropriately. Now I'm going to let you talk about what the one woman says about Eve here. I'll let you respond to that. I've I've talked enough about this, but yeah, this, I don't. I thought this was kind of weird, but um, let's see. It says uh, Eve is a classic example of a misunderstood female in Scripture. Contrary to di- to tradition, she's not created as the assistant or subordinate of the man. In fact, most often the Hebrew word ezer, which means helper, connotes superiority. And there's a bunch of references there, uh, thereby posing a rather different problem about this woman. Um, the accompanying phrase fit for or corresponding to a helper corresponding to, uh, tempers the connotation of superiority to, spe- to specify the mutuality of woman and man. Further, when the serpent talks with the woman, he uses plural verb forms, making her the spokesperson for the human couple, hardly the pattern of a patriarchal culture. 
she discusses theology intelligently. Speaking with clarity and authority, Eve is in fact both theologian, ethicist, hermeneut, and rabbi, and thus defies patriarchal stereotypes and reverses what church, synagogue, and academy have preached about women. I thought she was stretching it there a bit. A bit? I mean, <laughs> see, here's the, to, you know, to, to say that, that she was, you know, that this is a position of, of, of superiority, um, to that we have to look to St. Paul uh, talking about the, um, the order of creation. And um, that he says, because, you know, men were created first, women were created second. And so there is a, there's a, there's an element of, um, I don't like the word subordination, um, but I don't know a, a better one. Um, well, the, the thing is, though, is when the Bible talks about subordination, it's always a, it's always a middle tense. In order, in other words, it's always subordinate yourself. This is not that you are put in second place, but rather that you give yourself up to the other person and willingly put yourself in second place for the other person. Uh, so there's, you know, that's hard for us sometimes, I think, to get our, 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 our mind around, but it's not that Paul is ordering women to be in, to, 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 uh, 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 yield. It is that he's, in, you know, the women are to do this themselves. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a but even if you don't want to go down the subordination route, um, it, it, you can take Genesis, and I often take it as as a story, you know, as corresponding to uh, emphasizing the ideas of equality, mutuality, sharing, um, partnership. Yeah, well, I would really just get it. I I read her argument, um, you know, that it means superior to by uh, Ada Ada Spencer uh, in her book um, Beyond the Curse: Women Call to Ministry, but I don't buy it. <laughs> There, there, it, it's, it's, they, they argue it out of entomology, you know, the, what the root of the word means. Mm. But it's almost like, you know, well, to say I understand something means I stand under something. Mm. Yeah, yeah, you can't use etymology um, because words change in their meaning over time. So it's, it can be helpful to know where the word came from, but um, it, you know, not necessarily. Or at least it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what it means now. Um, you know, I, I always, I mean, I love the, um, the story of, of where God has, uh, Adam name all of the animals and, um, to try and find a helper and none of them were suitable. I mean, the whole point of that is saying, look, nothing else is going to fill that void in your life. All right. You were created specifically not to be alone, not to be, you know, you are incomplete without the woman. She completes you and you complete her, you know, they're one flesh. And, you know, and so the point was to show how important women are and, mm -hmm. you know, how great and wonderful they are. And first prayer in the Bible is in praise of women. This now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Yeah. So, ah, we got a babe. <laughs> <laughs> it's an army thing. So, um, there there was one uh, thing in here that that I um, also it said um, wisdom is described as a female attribute in many texts. All right. That's because wisdom in Hebrew is a feminine noun. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's, yeah, it has to be described using female uh, pronouns and, you know, and, and that because it's, it's a feminine noun. But right. it, it, that doesn't necessarily uh, as mean is, uh, The word spirit in the Old Testament yeah. is a feminine noun. Yeah, and, but that uh, doesn't imply uh, gender. Um, no, it doesn't necessarily. Anybody that studied language knows Any that. more than going up to, uh, this morning when I pulled into the gas station, I looked at the guy and said, fill her up. Doesn't they play my, my car is female. <laughs> you know, it's like, car. 
but we we give things those those genders sometimes for whatever reason. Yeah, you know, it's kind of sad though when you know uh, somebody takes a look at you know and talks about uh, you know some of the sexist uh, feminist scholars, you know, and assume the Bible is sexist, and really it isn't. It early church history by the early church history, um, women were respected more, given more leadership ability capabilities um, in the church than outside. Uh, that's just a simple fact. Uh, you know, they, they're, they're, they, they had more rights in the church in terms of divorce and things like that, uh, uh, in, in, in terms of choosing who to marry and when, if to marry. Uh, it was the church that would save female children who were left outside to be exposed and to die. You know, it was, it was just, you know, um, you know, and the church would, you know, it's just, it's just an incredible thing when we think about it. So people who say that the church is, 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 is sexist, no, it is not. That's not to say that sexism hasn't existed within the church. Mm-hmm. Um, just as the church, you know, Christianity is not racist, but that doesn't mean there haven't been racist in the Christian church. Right. You know, and that's the other thing here is that um, this whole uh, subordination thing, because the concept of, of subordinating yourself or whatever has been abused, people look at the abused form of it, um, you know, where the husband lords it over his wife and, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, they point to that and say, oh, look, you know, here, this is this is what you're talking about. No, no, no. That's an abuse of it. You know, the the Bible says husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave up his life for her. All right, your whole life is to be, um, you know, a living sacrifice to your wife. So, um, so no, there's. No what I part finally of that did was with, the, with that to kind of clarify it. No part of that. Uh, to clarify that, it's, I finally talked about mutual submission. You're giving a hundred percent of yourself to the other person all the time. Christ gave a hundred percent of himself to the church. We give a hundred percent of ourselves to him. That's the goal. That's that's what Paul's saying. Give a hundred percent of yourself to the other person, um, and look to the other person first. If you do that, you're going to be in good shape. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, love is by definition sacrifice. Speaking of subordination, yep. Let's move to uh, the guy in the picture here. Uh, since I get it brought up here, is Wayne Grudem, uh, one of the people. Nope, I'm in China. <laughs> nope, not there. There he is. There There's Wayne Grudem, there former professor at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, uh, now at Phoenix Seminary. And he and um, Bruce Ware, who also used to teach at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Um, oh, by the way, and, and Grudem is, at least was at one time, I think still is, um, the head of the Council for Biblical Manhood and Wo- Womanhood. And if you remember earlier, I talked about Christians for Biblical Equality, um, which was started by evangelical feminists uh, at Gordon Conwell. Bill Hybels was part of it. Um, I don't know if Rick Warren ever signed on. I think he may have. Um, but a lot of the people that I went to, uh, a lot of the people at my D men school were, were part of it. Uh, well, Grudem's group was kind of the counterpart, the, 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 the other side of that. This is the non-evangelical feminists. Uh, this is this is the and so they call themselves the um, egalitarians. That's the that's the evangelical feminists and Grudem and company call themselves the complementarians. So that's that's kind of it. But anyhow, so so he and and Bruce Ware, who are these complementarians, got into a discussion with Tom McCall, who currently teaches at. Uh, 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 at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and Keith Yandel, uh, uh, Yandel, a, a philosophy professor at uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, year old school, mm-hmm. and uh, so got into this whole discussion then, and it gets to this because what some people want to argue, and it has been argued in the LCMS as well. That um, you know Jesus is eternally subor- that the Son is eternally subordinate to the Father. I have no idea what that meant. Um, 
And um, others have argued, no, he's not. He became subordinate when he became human. But that's not necessarily something that came from eternity. Uh, and it's a very complex, and you get into these ancient Christological heresies like Arianism and some Belianism and some others. Um, and anyhow, so th- these two guys, these four guys had a debate at Trinity at Divinity School outside of Chicago. And it's really interesting. They had like, you know, what, like 450 people listening to these guys debate for, you know, uh, several hours. Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. It should be fascinating. Um, you know, the, the thing is, this stuff is really in depth. They use a lot of jargon and all that kind of stuff. And Christianity Today did a pretty decent job of, of kind of distilling it down so that people could understand it. Um, this stuff fascinates me because, a um, little uh, background story. When I was at the seminary, um, you have to take a class on the early church, all right? And there's like sort of life in the early church and then the councils of the early church, all right? Well, I wanted to take the life of the early church class because it sounded fascinating. I've always been kind of interested in that. And uh, it was full when it was my turn to register. And so I got stuck taking the councils class. And, oh, oh man, I was just really not happy at all. It's like, oh, yay, you know, uh, three, four hundred years of, of bureaucracy, you know. <laughs> and, um, but you know what? As I took the class and as I was getting into it, it really got interesting because I realized that a lot of the heresies that that these early councils were fighting against are still around today. And they keep popping up over and over and over. And it's like, guys, we covered this, you know, 1,700 years ago. It's already been discussed and, and, and settled. Why are you bringing this up again? You know, just go read the writings that have, that still survive. You know, this is already covered. And, uh, and, and it wasn't a matter of, uh, you know, some, um, uh, conspiracy theorists like to say, well, it, it was, you know, it was just covered up and it was, uh, you know, it was, it, it was discrimination. It was the, um, you, you know, people were part of the wrong political party or whatever, you know, like, no, they didn't have a leg to stand on. You know, they presented their, um, their rationale and, uh, you know, the other side, uh, presented theirs and, they had a, a, you know, theirs made more sense according to the Bible. So I do appreciate that they're actually working with the Bible here. And and they're not saying, well, pfft, you know, that, that part, you know, Jesus didn't really say that or, you know, that kind of stuff. And these guys are actually working with the biblical text. So that was that was refreshing. All right. If you're going to have this discussion, mm-hmm. you have to actually take the Bible in its entirety. You can't get rid of the parts you don't like. So, um, so I did. I really appreciated that because uh, that seems to be so rare nowadays um, in biblical scholarly discussions. Um, so, uh, the question of of subordination. Um. Where do we stand on this, Jim? I really, I, I oh, thank you for putting me on the, the, the spot here. Um, he has gone unchallenged long enough. We can definitely say that Christ subordinated himself to the Father's will. That's what Philippians 2 teaches. Though being equal with God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself human and found in this form of a, uh, 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 found in the form of a servant. Um, and being found in such form, he became uh, he became obedient to death, even in death on the cross. So here we have he, you know, emptied himself, became obedient, uh, subordinating himself to the Father's wishes. First Corinthians fifteen says, and it. it passage drove me crazy when I was a kid, that at the end of the time, everything will be subject to Christ, and he himself will become subject to the Father. Um, what I have always seen in the Trinity 
is this don't look at me. This 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 understanding that there's equality, but there's also I'm gonna say uh deference. Mm-hmm. So the Holy Spirit brings us to faith, but the Holy Spirit says, Don't look at me, look at Jesus. Mm-hmm. And Jesus says, Don't look at me, look at the Father. You know, so Yeah, and the Father says I don't, like don't look at me, look at the Son. Yeah, don't look at me, yeah. Look at you know, look look at my son who's given himself for you. I don't know if I like the word subordination here. I like the I, I, I almost prefer the word deference. Because they defer to one another. Mm-hmm. I think that's a stronger mm-hmm. word. Now, the, the interesting uh, part in here comes in with the concept of obedience. You know, the son is obedient to the father, and he was obedient to the father in even in becoming flesh. All right? So in that sense, you could almost say subordination. And, you know, in the sense of just that God has given us, that he's defined himself as, you know, father and son and, and Holy Spirit. But, you know, if he's used this term father, it does have a certain sense of authority um, over a son. Right. But at the same time, you can't see it's this idea of, uh, you know, the father saying, okay, you know, okay, son, um, you're going to go to, to, to earth, you know, and I mean, the, you know, God the son was part of this whole plan of um, salvation from the beginning. Right. See, part of the thing that, that it gets into, you know, when I read this stuff, I mean, it is that the concept of the Trinity is so far beyond us. You know, how in the world do you have three completely separate individual beings and yet one God? Mm-hmm. Not a committee like the like the the, the, the the Mormons wanted to say, but each one fully, completely, totally God. Yeah. yeah no. Three gods, you only have one God. I, we can't, it makes my head hurt every time I think of it, you know. And the only thing we can do, really, is fall down on our knees before God in awe at his, at his, at his wonder. Mm-hmm. You know, and so I think when we start trying to get into this stuff and we're trying to, trying to deal with it, it's, it's just mind blowing. You really can't, you know, it, there's this concepts here that just go beyond us. At the same time, I think it's really important to discuss it. I think these kind of debates are really important because it's in doing these things, people are digging into scripture and they're studying it and they're trying to, you know, make sense of it. And it's through that kind of stuff that we came up with the doctrine of the Trinity to begin with. You know, so we um, came up with the doctrine of the Trinity. <laughs> okay, I worded that one wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we came to understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Put it that way. Sorry. That, that came out kind of wrong. But <laughs> kind of wrong. <laughs> well, we, you know, we put it into. We were able to put it into words. Do we want our know? picture on a newspaper that comes out of New Haven, Missouri? <laughs> Complete with your picture, you know? We came, we came up with the doctrine of the Trinity. <laughs> you know what I meant. <laughs> yeah, there's a sound Children's bite for you. They're going to love you. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> but no, these are very, very... Um, uh, um, Important discussions, and they're complex discussions. But you know, you, you took this course, you know, in the history of the early church, and uh, and and one of the things I get into a little bit with my my students uh, when we talk about Christology is some of these Christological controversies in the early church, and you know, and and, and they're based on just you know little phrases. Mm-hmm. Uh, the whole the, the Nicene, the whole question of the Nicene Creed, you know, it's often said that that's the argument over the diphthong. Homo Oseus versus Homo Oseus. Yep. Yeah. So, oh, which is how with that that phrase being of one substance uh, with the Father, and what does or, that word "substance" mean? Oh, yeah. That. Oh, what do you mean "substance"? Exactly. What does that word mean? Um, it's a Greek 
philosophical, a philosophical term. But, you know, and how do you, you know, argue with, you know, and what about begotten, you know? I said, you know, because, you know, it's got to tell me, Joe's witness like that. And he's, like, he's begotten of the Father. He's not the Father. I'm like, you know, he's not really, a, like, but it's begotten, not made. The Arians would say Jesus was created. You know, the, the church wasn't quite sure what the idea of begotten really meant either, exactly what that, you know. Yeah. But the idea was he was not created. It was argument against being created. And it's the difference between getting a child and carving a statue. Well, it was also the difference of, um, you know, here's, here's something to consider. All right. God was the father from eternity. You can't be a father without a son. So, you know. From eternity. Yeah. The son was the son. From, yeah, there's another concept for you to wrap your head around. Eternity, you know. The 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 other question of uh uh what was God doing, you know, for eternity until uh until he created the universe? Somebody asked Martin Luther that question one time. Luther said he was creating hell for people that asked stupid questions like that. <laughs> Can we go to something where my head hurts less now, please? Yeah, take your pick. <laughs> Let's go to China. Yeah, there's no pain there. <laughs> well, there's pain there, but my head won't hurt. This is a little bit easier. This is interesting. Um, that uh, China is, um, you know, uh, kind of doing away with... with, with, with uh, classical religious music. Yep, so like Handel's Messiah, gone. Not allowed. Uh, you know, most of Bach stuff. Uh, uh, boy, a lot of classical music. Handel? Yeah, yeah Handel's Messiah, Bach, Mendelssohn. Uh, be an incredible amount of music on. Um, because um you know uh, uh um they they want to get rid of um you know Christianity, which is really kind of a, a very sad thing um, but you know if you're going to be a a a, a secular uh atheistic culture, what they're saying makes perfect sense uh, because now she says now there's no um um, this, uh, uh, she says, um, the spread of Christianity in China has not originated in the concert halls of the cities, which may be true. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is, though, that in China, in Japan, people have become Christian by listening to the music of, 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 of Bach. Really? Yes. Cool. So, well, that, that is that, that I I can't remember where I read that. I was reading that some some someplace about the the growth in Christianity uh, in in Japan due to the influence of Bach and his music. Um, some people even call Bach the fifth evangelist. <laughs> I know someone who would probably call him that. Somebody that I used to work for down at the seminary. Now, I know I know several people who feel that way, and he great, awesome in music and everything else, awesome theologian Bach was. But so I thought it was interesting, though, that China says no. We, we, we realizing, you know, how many people can, you know, could be presented with a Christian faith through this music, just tossing it out now. Yeah. Um says the Communist Party watched the spread of Christianity with a far more apprehensive gaze because it presented people with an alternative authority, God, and an alternative set of rules. State-run Chinese websites still cite instances of foreign missionaries using religion to, quote, serve in the interests of colonialism and imperialism, uh, stretching back to the 19th century as if it had all happened just yesterday. So... They let it be known Western religious music should no longer be performed in concert halls. At the same time, it's interesting because the woman who wrote this says she, you know, she took part in the Messiah, and um, you know, said there are atheists and agnostics. You know, was not for 
So it was not an exercise in evangelism. But it was. It is. You know, to sit there listening to the Messiah and hearing in music the great um, uh, um, scripture text from Isaiah 40. And, uh, I, you know, the other chapters there in Isaiah 53 uh, put to music. Uh, and yeah, let every mountain, you know, you, you know, let every valley be exalted and every mountain laid low and the glory of the Lord will shine upon you. I mean, and of course, in the Haldia course, the, you know, the celebrating, you know, Christ's resurrection. I don't see how you could, you know, listen to that and, and not be struck by what God has done. Mm-hmm. Well, if you're listening to the lyrics that closely. You know, especially in China, if they're singing this in, um, well, uh, either English or, um, of course, Alleluia is Hebrew, but um, what was it originally written in? Latin? English. Was it? Yeah. Okay. Not in order in English. All right. So... Um, you know, listening to this and, and these people, for them, uh, I Chinese people on average, some speak English, some don't. Uh, most who do don't do so very well um, because there was, I remember with the Olympics, they were uh, instructing them on, um, you know, kind of being really careful with their English and stuff so they don't come across sounding ridiculous and uh all you have to do is look at packaging that was written in china and you know all the the goofy instructions and stuff that you get that make no sense um and so you're gonna have a lot of people aren't really gonna understand it um boy i know when i listen to well when i listen to classical music it's very rare that I get to a concert hall to listen to it. Um, for me, it's generally more background music when I'm writing sermons or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, how, how closely are you listening to the actual lyrics as opposed to um, just the, the movement of the, the music itself? I don't know. I think, of course, it's always the thing about, you know, did, did you hear the lyrics right? Uh, I had a friend of mine in college, and um, you know, the part there that where they go, uh, all we like sheep, you know, all we like sheep. You know, and, then, and you hear the little, you know, music there after and stuff. She thought growing up they were singing, we like cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I remember her telling us that. I was just going to be a laugh out of that. Uh, no, I just think that was just very fascinating. I really do. Um, and uh, so I thought it was interesting, though, that, the, that, you know, I guess if you want to keep Christianity out of China, you know, this is this is the way to do it. Keep them from listening to classical music. No Bach, no Handel. Gosh, it almost sounds like a um, U.S. United States public school. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, this I, I just find this really... Um sort of amusing in a, a very sad way um, just with uh, um, having watched the Olympics relatively recently there and and uh, they're talking about how oh it's 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 opened up so much and you know and all this kind of stuff and like oh, Olympics are over all right no more Bach you know <laughs> so like you know people are still watching and in, in fact it, it mentions in the story um, all the the problems that China has uh, been dealing with uh, as far as being in the, the public eye. Um, the uh, the food safety uh, cover-ups, uh, the Olympic, uh, all the, um, the problems that they had with the Olympics, and they didn't even get into all the scandals, uh, like the, the lip-syncing and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Um, the natural disasters, and they don't. They also don't mention the the whole lead paint, um, you know, debacle. And so, you know, there's just China. China just never looks good in the public eye. 
There, there's just so many things that they do wrong. And, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I think that they should just say, you know what, we don't care. <laughs> We're just going to do what we want and we don't care what anybody else thinks. But that's not really good for them either because they do need to uh, work with other countries and, and stuff like that. It's a global economy and all that. So, I don't know. They don't need to care what we think in the United States because, you know, if we argue with them too loud, they'll say, fine, <laughs> give us our money back, you owe us. <laughs> well, we owe them some. And the, the other problem, of course, is like uh, so much is created in China, including our uh, Apple Macintoshes and our Apple iPods. Yep. Yes. So. Thank you, China. You make this podcast um, possible. Well, let's go. I'm okay. sure they appreciate that. <laughs> Even if they blocked us for a while, maybe maybe at the end, Dale, you should put some Bach on, see if they, you know, block us again. <laughs> well, we started in Chicago. Uh, let's end to Chicago, and uh, this time we've got an. Uh, this is from the CBS story out there, and it's a. Um, uh, the Social Justice Pride Campus. <laughs> what a what a name. Uh, but it, uh, yeah, the Pride Campus of Social Justice High School. Uh, it would be open to students citywide, but would provide a safe, gay-friendly atmosphere to combat high high bullying, dropout, and depression rate among any many lay, uh, many uh, lesbian, uh, bisexual, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, questioning students. And gay and lesbian historical figures would be taught so gay youth could have heroes. I think we call that a, your local public high school. Isn't it? <laughs> I, this is like separate but equal. <laughs> let's, let's round up all the gays and put them in this school over here. <laughs> Good plan. Uh, I'm sorry. Anytime you have a, a now, these schools would not be specifically segregated. Um, that you know anybody could go there, but you know what? When you have a school that is going to uh, specifically favor um, a, a particular group of people, most of the people that go there are going to be of that persuasion, um, or you know you're going to get people of a certain political persuasion. You know, you're not going to have a lot of Republicans uh, attending, you know, I mean, and quite frankly, I, I just love to see something like this and someone shows up in like a McCain Palin T-shirt. Guess who's going to get beat up at that school? <laughs> you know, come and see the violence inherent in the system. Help, help. I'm being repressed. So, yeah, um, yeah. If, when they have the opportunity to become more tolerant of others, uh, to think differently than they do, um, then the students are better off. Oh, really? Uh, tolerance. Um, you want to allow people to think differently. So does that mean if you believe that homosexuality is a sin that you can attend that school? You know? What are you tolerant of? And what differing opinion? Are you really tolerant of differing opinions? Or is this to teach everyone tolerance of your opinion? And uh, how um, you know, how does it get played out? Uh, there was a case out in um, California earlier this week where, um, or, you know, I read about it this week, maybe it took place last week where a lesbian first-grade teacher took her first-grade class to be a field trip to her wedding to her partner. Hmm. I mean, it's, you know... I mean, I just thought, like, oh, she did what? You know, I was kind of trying to figure out who they, um, you know... How, you know, what'd you put on the permission slip going home to the parents? Because, well, the parents had no idea what was going on. You know, and, I don't know. I just kind of had to kind of laugh at some of those because uh, uh, they, you know, it's, oh, we think it'll be majority straight because um, it's going to um, 
uh, uh, it's going to have a good college prep curriculum and its message of social justice and tolerance. Find a happy place. Find a happy place. Find a happy place. I don't think that's going to. It. You know what's going to be known as? It's going to be known as the gay high school. That's what it's going to be known as. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, if you attend there, everyone's going to assume you're gay. So mm-hmm. um, even if you're not. And quite frankly, no straight kid's going to want to attend there <laughs> because he's not going to want everybody thinking he's gay. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine trying to get a date if you go there and you're straight? <laughs> it'd, be, it'd, be like, it'd be like our seminary campus, you know? <laughs> you're going to have to look elsewhere, buddy. <laughs> I mean, you know, Massachusetts is not Iowa. Okay, I have to tell you this, Dale. Okay, really? and every every high school here has a has a gay straight alliance. Uh, my kids know many who are who, who 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 just like you did in college. Know many who are gay and lesbian. Um, last year, uh, they had this this movie night at my my son's high school. And uh, he wanted to go to it, and you know, then came home. I said, "What, what did you watch? You know, what were the movies?" And uh, I can't. One of them was the Matthew Shepard story, and I can't remember what the other one was, but it was another gay themed movie. I said, "What was this gay night at the movies?" Said, oh yeah, it was. It was sponsored by the the Gay Street Alliance because I didn't realize that. I Brokeback said, Mountain. I think it might have been. <laughs> um, although it was rated R, so I don't know if they could show that to a bunch of high school freshmen. Um, hey, but they showed yeah. in my when my daughter was in fourth, fourth or fifth grade. They showed uh, they showed him Spider Man, which is rated PG thirteen. Yeah, that's true. But anyway, um, but probably what maybe probably was Brokeback Mountain. But you know, it was just you know, and and, and but I'm just like you know, there's there's an indoctrination thing here. Uh, and uh, I, I said, well, what do you think? Because a bunch of us just, it's just said that, that we couldn't leave once we got there. You know, they said, you know, if you leave, you can't come back in. And and he, he, and he didn't have a cell phone, so he didn't have a way to hold him. He said, we just, we said but, but they were selling concessions out back, so we just all went out and re- sat around the popcorn and talked all night. <laughs> we ignored the man. But that's that's just, you know, part of life up here. Um you know, but I don't even, you know. Now, there is another majority gay high school um, in the country, and that's in New York, Harvey Milk School. No, we're not homosexual, but we are willing to learn. But I even think, uh, um, I even think that's a better name than the Pride Campus of Social Justice, whatever that was. Well, there's one in Milwaukee, yeah. too. Is there? Yep. Uh, it's, it's in the story. Alliance High School in Milwaukee considers itself gay-friendly, but has only 125 students. Would you rather be alone? So, and it's uh, 60 to 70 percent uh, GLBT. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is indoctrination. You, you know, we're teaching you to have an open mind as long as you agree with us and um, don't want us to uh, to tolerate you. You know, it's that new definition of tolerance used to be the tolerant meant, I think you're wrong, but I'll allow you to, to hold that position. Nowadays, tolerance is, um, nobody's wrong. All right. Uh, now, just in case you think Dale and I are these, you know, overly conservative, stick in the mud, you know, preachers here, um, uh, a young, uh, uh, uh a high school senior from Whitney Young uh, High School named Renee Lima, said, who is a bisexual student and pre- president of Whitney Young Pride, uh, Gay Pride Club, um, says, um, and, and this is a guy, by the way, name, even though his first name is Renee, uh, I think it I- isolates students. I think it doesn't reflect the real world. Mm-hmm. There's your separate mm-hmm. but equal comment there, Dale, you right. know, to isolate students. Right. Um I think the idea behind it's wonderful, but I don't think it will be a positive thing. 
because everyone will be in one place and there are people who are homophobic, said Whitney Young Sr., Gabriela Rosa. So, you know, the student, that this is, yeah, uh, um, this is a uh, um, magnet high school where they have diversity. But, you know, even they have, you know, they understand where, where it's coming from. They say, hey, look, here it is. You know, they, they see that same issue. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It, the, the, all right. Now, here, here's the thing. Um, you know, because we believe that the Bible is true, we believe that uh, homosexuality is not God's intention uh, for uh, expressions of, of, um, of sexuality. Uh, the Bible's definition is one man, one woman, married for life. And, uh, and anything outside of that is not God's intention. And, um, you know, so we're not just, it's not that we're just picking on uh, homosexuals and, and stuff like that. This also applies to people, uh, the old term used to be shacking up, right? Um, that's just as sinful. And, um, or for that matter, you know, whether they're living together or not, any kind of sexual contact outside of marriage is contrary to God's will for us uh, because he wants something better. You know, he says, don't, don't settle for something different. And, you know, this is something that, um, very often, this is the way the devil works is he takes a gift of God and then he twists it. You know, I mean, you look all the way back to uh, the Garden of Eden. You know, God gave them all this fruit, you know, and even the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil was beautiful. Okay. And, but he twists it. He says, oh, well, you know, you got all this other fruit. What about this fruit? You know, and um, even though God was very clear, you know, he just took that gift of God and he twisted it. All right. Well. I mean, let's face it, sexuality is one of the most beautiful gifts that God has given to us, all right? And and it seems like the more beautiful and wonderful the gift is, the easier it is to twist, and the worse it is once you twist it. And, you know, so to take this gift, and, and consequently, because getting back to what I was talking about before, about people taking the abuse and making it to be the... um. The, the, the main thing that everyone focuses on, right? Well, sexuality is a perfect example of that. There's lots of places and times and in ways that it's abused, all right? And so um, because of that, it's caused, it's really affected our society in a very negative way. And, um, you know, we've got, besides uh, things like homosexuality and stuff like that, we've got... Um, you know, there's uh, the couples living together and uh, before they're married. You got divorce. Um, you know, you've got just just all kinds of, of different ways that this twisted around. And you look at all the damage that it causes. And um, so, to to say, well, you know, we should just accept this or or whatever, you know. We're not homophobic. We're not afraid of, of homosexuals. I have some very close friends um, who are homosexual, and they know what I believe, and and um, and and they disagree with me, and we talk about it, but we still respect each other. I mean, because the other side of this coin is that disagreeing with their particular um, you know position on this issue uh, it does not mean that you somehow have the right to uh, to persecute that person, right? So, but at the same time, by isolating them, you're not going to teach them how to, um, you're, you're not going to teach anybody how to live peacefully with somebody that they disagree with, you know? And so, you know, I, I believe in tolerance, um, in, in certain situations like this. Okay. But not the world's definition of tolerance. I'm talking about the, um, you know, 30 years ago definition of tolerance, yeah, what he said. Uh, sorry, sorry about that, folks. Uh, I Dale, Dale was speaking. My pit bull decided it's a good idea to try playing with his toy that my wife got for him, and he's getting close to this cord by a lamp that may come off because he can't seem to figure out not to go near it. <laughs> so I'm trying to save my light here. I'll be back. 
It did get very difficult, though, to talk about in terms of what what is tolerance. It really does mean to be respectful of another position, um, even one that you disagree with. Uh, and I, you know, I, I certainly teach my kids, um, you know, that you know, there's a lot of things we believe are unbiblical. But people do have the right to be wrong. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to do any good for us to speak to them in nasty ways. But rather, we are to speak to them as Christ would, gently, kindly, lovingly, but also point out where we think they're wrong. Right. Yeah. You look at how Jesus talked to the um, the uh, Syrophoenician woman at the well and the Samaritan woman. You know, he said, look, what you're doing is wrong. Right? Um, or wait, which is I always get those two mixed up. The the one that was living with the guy and she'd had like seven husbands. Anyway, um, you know, he says, look, you know, what you're doing is wrong. But at the same time, you know, he didn't send her away. He didn't beat her or, you know, or anything like that. You, know, you have the, the story of the, the woman who was caught in adultery and they were going to stone her to death. All right. He saves her life, but then he turns to her and says, go and sin no more, right? What she was doing was sin, and, and he didn't sugarcoat that. But the message was, yeah, you're a sinner, right? But that's why I came, to save sinners. And um, Absolutely. You know, this, is, this is actually hits on what I'm preaching on this week. Um, it's the idea that we can, um, we, we, try to, we try to trap God. We try to um, excuse sin and and tr- sort of trick God into allowing things uh, or saying, oh, that's not really sin or something like that. Uh, we had a really interesting discussion in um, my confirmation class this week about, um, we were talking about the fifth commandment, shall not murder, and uh, what's murder and what's not. And, and you know, we sort of tossed around some scenarios where you go, well, would this be sin or wouldn't it, you know, and, and kind of debated about it for a while. And, and finally, um, what we settled on was, you know what, in some situations you don't know. And, or there's some situations where, man, no matter what you do, someone's going to get hurt, you know, and, um, and, and you don't know whether you made the right decision or not. And so in those situations, um, what you do is you take it to God and say, God, I, I don't know if I sinned or not here. Um, so if I did, please forgive me. And he does. And, uh, either way, you're good. You, you know, you're forgiven and, and, um, you know, you, and you, you move on. And, uh, you know, if your conscience is bothering you about it, don't do it again. But, um, or try to avoid it if possible. But ultimately, just keep taking it back to God and know that he forgives you. Oh, very nice, Ben. Very good. Okay. Well, we got into some heavy topics tonight, a little bit of politics, which we've been getting into, and probably we'll hit again before um, things go over. i got to reset my background here. <laughs> uh, I got into that whole issue of, of homosexuality, which is always difficult. Hit on the issue of uh, evangelical feminism and hit on uh, 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 um, the doctrine of the Trinity a little bit. So uh, plus a little Bach got thrown in there just just for fun um i mean just some very heavy topics tonight we would love your comments your thoughts your interactions um and uh, you can get those to us at podcast at crossfeednews.com yeah and if you're watching this in itunes don't bother clicking i keep forgetting to (laughs) to put that in there and very rarely does anybody use it anyway so just send us an email podcast at crossfeednews.com um, or, uh, uh, by all means, uh, leave a review up at iTunes. Um, if you want to, uh, communicate with me, uh, directly throughout the week, um, you can follow me on Twitter. Twitter name is Crossfeed News. Um, be happy to, to talk to anybody out there about just about anything. Mm. And, um, and as always, if you see any interesting news stories, uh, post them up at, at crossfeednews.com. Mm-hmm. If you ever run into any problems uh, posting stuff, uh, just send us a note. Uh, there's a feedback form there on the site. And um, and let us know what your problem is, and we'll make sure to take care of it. 
Oh, just a real quick shout out, by the way, to the guys uh, at uh, uh, developers of Mecha Manga Bible Stories, since uh, they they gave a really appreciated our review last week and said said we were fair. And I really liked it. He said on one of them, he said, "It's at 57 minutes in, but listen to the whole show. That's kind of fun." <laughs> so uh, you know. We have a mutual admiration society here. So. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So if anybody found us, I have noticed that our um, our uh, subscriber numbers, uh, specifically the video, um, is up by about ten percent of of what it's been. It's been pretty static, and just lately, it's it's been up a bit. So welcome to um, any new subscribers. Uh, happy to have you on board. From ten to eleven, huh? <laughs> So, um, okay, thank you everybody for watching and listening and everything else. God give you just a wonderful week and weekend. Yep. Good night, everybody. God bless.